it's too hot, the lines are too long, there's too many strollers, it's too crowded, it's so expensive. These are not unusual phrases that are uttered, but they didn't seem to stop the 20 million people from visiting the theme park flagship of the world, Disney's Magic Kingdom last year. 20 million people. That's a, a long way from the 400,000 visitors that the park had in 1971 when the park first opened. Also, the today price tag of over $126 is a long way from the previous $3.50 <laughs> admission ticket that it used to be when the park first opened. But price hasn't seemed to significantly impact those that are going to the Magic Kingdom. And in fact, the Magic Kingdom is going to continue to expand. Already, we see that the Magic Kingdom has Epcot, uh, MG, uh, Hollywood Studios, Animal Kingdom, numerous resorts, and a few water parks. Currently, Disney World is about 7,100 acres the size of San Francisco, but there's still room for expansion because Disney actually has about 20,000 acres in Florida that have yet to be developed. And I believe that we'll continue to see Disney continue to grow because people just love Disney. The New York Post says that it's become a, an American ritual to go to Disney. Now, I have to admit, and those of you that know me know that I absolutely love Disney, everything Disney. Even in my college classes when the students are doing their work, we play Disney music in the background. I love Disney. My daughter, she turned seven yesterday. I put together a, a pixie hollow sleepover party for her where she and her friends were little fairies and stuff. I love Disney. But if I take a step back to think about it, I wonder if the reason why I love Disney so much and so many other people love Disney so much is because it, it allows us to get a break from the real world. It allows us to be the part of somebody else's story where happy endings are almost guaranteed. In fact, there was a travel publication that said Disney World is the only guaranteed vacation. All other vacations, you never know what you're going to get, but Disney almost guarantees your experience. You know, you know exactly what you're going to get. They make sure that every detail is thought about. So even though there's thousands of people there, you feel like you're the only one getting this experience. That's where the magic comes. But this begs the question for the magic kingdom. If the magic is Disney creating these experiences where you almost have a guaranteed vacation, how is it a kingdom? For something to be a kingdom, there has to be a king. So who's the king? Is it a cartoon character with big ears? Is the king a, 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 a man that died even before the park had opened? You know, I, I was thinking about this, and I think that one of the reasons Americans love Disney so much is because what really has been created was an experience where the guest is the king. The guest is the king. Everything's designed so the guests can enjoy and indulge in whatever they like. That sounds like America to me. Maybe that's why it's become an American ritual, because we are looking to build these kingdoms that we reign. But that's not the kingdom that God had in mind. Although Disney may be fun, the magic kingdom is not the kingdom that God had in mind. Let's look to the word. This is Luke 1, 32 through 33. Luke 1, 32 through 33. It'll be on the screen, but I encourage you to uh, look it up for yourself. And also, again, uh, we do have a Bible embedded into our app, so you can pull up our app device and you can read it there as well. This is how the scripture reads. He will be great 
and we be, will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end, says the word of God. The title of this morning's message is The Master's Kingdom. Before we plunge into the Old Testament series titled Kingdoms, I wanted us to be reminded that Jesus came to establish the kingdom of God on earth. And we need to respond to it, be ready for it, and represent it everywhere we go if we want to be a part of it. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this time today of uh, God allowing us to be here and worship together. God, we acknowledge that you are in this space. And God, in this moment, as the preach word comes forward, I ask that you empty me of myself so that the words that come out of my mouth are not my own, but they are your words from your spirit so that they, they fall on the ears of your children in such a customized way that everybody under the sound of my voice leaves this place hearing a customized message, that they leave here hearing what they need to hear so they could move forward being equipped, empowered, and ready to do your work and to do it your way. And for that, God will give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. So what is the kingdom of God? Have you, have you thought about this? Is it heaven? Is it in your heart? Is it here? Is it yet to come? You may have heard all of these perspectives, but what is the kingdom of God? It's important that we have a good understanding of this because we know that it's a theme that runs throughout the entire Bible. We see in Zechariah 14.9, it says, The Lord will be king over the earth. On that day, there will be one Lord and his name the only name. Daniel 7.14 says, He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. We see in the New Testament, John the Baptist is preaching about the kingdom of God. In Matthew 3, 2, he's telling uh, the listeners to repent because the kingdom of God has come near. We see Paul talking about the kingdom of God in Acts 19:8. In Revelation, we see that John speaks of the kingdom. He says, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. We even see the kingdom of God as the central theme of Jesus's ministry. For example, in Matthew 9, 35, it says Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. For us to understand the kingdom, I, I submit that we have to go back to the beginning. So let's journey in our mind back to the beginning. Let's go to Genesis 1 and 2. In Genesis 1 and 2, we see God created the heavens and the earth. He spoke them into existence, and it was good. Then he fashioned, he made man in his own image. See, here we see a picture of the kingdom of God. We see order, beauty, intimacy, no shame, joy, abundance. We see God as a loving king over all, through all, and in his creation. And humanity, then Adam and Eve, were subjects to this kingdom. They were subjects to the king. So like a subject in any kingdom, there were rules and responsibilities that they ad had to adhere to. But soon, we see that there's another kingdom that comes onto the scene, a kingdom of darkness. This was a counterfeit kingdom established on the earth under Satan's rule. Adam and Eve, they made a choice to no longer be subjects to the kingdom of God, but to be subjects now under the dark kingdom, which means they 
in all of humanity by association became subjects to all of the rules of that kingdom. Death, disease, pain, illness, discontentment, shame, etc. These are the rules of the kingdom of darkness that Adam and Eve and then all of humanity became subject to. But history didn't stop there. Not soon after the kingdom of darkness came on the scene, not soon after Adam and Eve decided that they're going to step out of the covering of the kingdom of God and step into the covering of the kingdom of darkness, we see God declaring in Genesis 3 that he would one day send someone who would deal a fatal blow to Satan and his kingdom. That person was God himself, Jesus Christ. This is why we call Jesus Christ our personal Lord and Savior, because he is the Lord, he's the king, but he saved us from the kingdom of darkness. He brought us out of that kingdom. He saved us from being under the rules and the reign of that kingdom. So when Jesus came into the world, he dealt a fatal blow to the kingdom of darkness, restoring humanity to the rightful kingdom in which it belonged, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is where God rules and reigns. So in the kingdom of God, there's perfect order. There's a fullness of joy. There's peace. There's no pain because the perfect God rules in perfect love. This is the good news. This is the good news that Jesus was talking about when he announced that the kingdom of God was at hand. The good news was that the power of of the dark kingdom would be broken and was weakened. That because of Jesus, a fatal blow was given to the dark kingdom, freeing all those that were subject to the dark kingdom from that rule. That's the good news. I, I like how theologian Gordon Fee says it. He said it like this. In Christ, God has planted his flag on the planet Earth and declared for all the universe to hear, I declare this to be mine. I declare this to be mine. Jesus is the king. Jesus was the kingdom of God on Earth. This is why he can walk on water, heal the sick, cast out demons, because he was not operating under the rules of the kingdom of darkness. He was walking under the rules of the kingdom of God. So he was able to do amazing things. He was able to do things that we can't even conceive because we have been a slave to sin for so long that we have forgotten what it's like to be a part of the kingdom of God. And then Jesus died and was resurrected, and he left his spirit, which now allows us, those that believe, to say we are no longer going to be subjects to the kingdom of darkness because the spirit of God is in me. I can now be once again subject to the spirit of God. This is the good news, that sin no longer has to be your master because you can be now part of the master's kingdom. You you no longer have to be under this rule because of what Jesus did, because of what Jesus did. You no longer have to be under the kingdom of darkness, but you can walk fully in the kingdom of God because the spirit of God can reign and rule in your heart. The kingdom of God can reign and rule in your heart. This is what the good news was all about. Jesus did not come just so you can have eternal life. Jesus came so you can have a new life that can start now. It wasn't just someday in the future. We know this to be true because Jesus, after he was resurrected, after he resurrected, he just didn't ascend back into heaven immediately. Acts 1-3 says, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them convincing proof that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. If it was just about you having eternal life, Jesus would not have spent time after he, you, eternal life was already guaranteed, he defeat death. That was a given. 
But he wanted, there still was a piece of the message that he wanted to make sure people understood, and that was that the kingdom of God, we can have access to it now. So God did not just come for you to have an eternal life, a happily ever after someday in the future. He came so you could be restored as a subject to the kingdom of God today. So, yes. The kingdom of God is heaven because God rules and reigns there. But the kingdom of God is also a physical, invisible kingdom of God that was brought to earth through Jesus Christ that we can be subjects to by accepting Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior. You can choose to operate in God's kingdom instead of the kingdom of darkness. By making the choice to allow God to rule and reign in your life, you're making a choice to operate in the master's kingdom instead of the dark kingdom. But the kingdom of God will also one day be fully visible on earth. It's not just an invisible reality. One day, the kingdom of God will be fully visible on earth. This is why Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 24, then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion and authority and power. When Jesus returns, he will establish a visible physical kingdom on earth where he will reign as king, bringing things back to complete order, establishing a new heaven and a new earth. So yes, There's an invisible kingdom now, but there will be a fully established, visible kingdom where Jesus sits as king. That's a lot. To say that the kingdom of God is here, but also the kingdom of God has yet to come, it almost sounds like a contradiction of sorts. It sounds like one of those things that if you were to ask your parents who their favorite child was, like one of those answers that, huh? What are you talking about? It it, it sounds, it's almost mind-boggling to say something's here, but something's not yet here. But consider this. So on, on June 6, 1944, the Allied forces, Britain, America, Canada, and France attacked Germany, okay? They attacked the German forces on the coast of Normandy, France, with a huge force of over 150,000 people. The Allies attacked and gained victory, and this became the turning point of World War II, okay? This became the turning point. The access powers of Germany, Italy, and Japan were weakened significantly, and they knew that they would, that they would lose the war. This day, was known as V-Day. But it wasn't until almost a year later that the battle actually stopped happening, and or on that first day was V-Day, or D-Day. It was a year later that the battle actually stopped fighting, and that was known as V-Day. So you had D-Day when the enemy knew that they lost the war, But technically, the battle, the war kept going for almost a year later at what was known as V-Day. See, but the thing is, in between D-Day and V-Day, there were more casualties in the war during that period than any other time period in the war. That period between D-Day and V-Day, there were more casualties in the war than at any other time during the war. It's the same thing with the kingdom of God. When Jesus conquered death and delivered a blow to the kingdom of darkness, Satan knew the war had been lost. It was over. There's no chance that he could win. But the battle still goes on. So Satan is prowling around like a lion looking to devour people, as many people as he can, before Jesus comes back and ends the war for good. So even though the war was won at the death and resurrection of Christ, the battle continues and it will will continue until Jesus comes back and and ends the war. 
It's the same thing. So yes, it's here, but it's still to come. So this begs the question, what does this mean for us today? What does this mean for us living in the time period between D-Day and V-Day? What does it mean for us Christians living in the time period between the resurrection and the return? What, how do we interact with the kingdom of God when we are in this time, when casualties are increasing? What do we do? There's three things I want to share with you today. And the first is we have to respond to it. We have to respond to the kingdom. We need to respond to it. Knowing about it isn't enough. You have to respond to it. This was the challenge with the Jews in Jesus' day. They knew Jesus. They saw the miracles. They, they, they could tell that he was different than anybody they ever met before, but they didn't respond to Jesus. We cannot confuse our knowledge with our response. If we are going to walk as subjects to the kingdom, we have to respond. This response is what Jesus was talking about when he was explaining the parable of the sower. You know, he said that there's a few different types of soils and the farmer goes out scattering seeds. Some of the seeds land on a path, right? But the soil doesn't respond. There's, there's, there's nothing that happens. So the enemy is able to come and grab the seed. Right? Then Jesus says, well, there's a different type of soil where um, there, the, 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 the seed gets snatched up quickly. Right? It, some, something started to happen, but because of uh, the response being more focused on the problems of the world and not on Christ, the seed gets snatched up. Then there's another type of soil, right, where you're responding more towards uh, trying to acquire wealth, wealth and earthly possessions, So you're responding to monetary things, but you're not responding as much to God. Seed gets snatched up. But then there's a good soil, Jesus says, that the seed penetrates deep, right? Because the listener hears and understands and a crop is yielded, is what the scripture tells us. See, the thing is, in that Uh, original language, the word understand, what it means is to put facts together, is what the original word used uh, understand means, to put the facts together. See, the fact is that Jesus was 100% God and 100% man, loved you enough to die for you while you were still a sinner, conquered death for once and for all, and was resurrected so you can be out of the kingdom of darkness, into the kingdom of light. That is the fact. It's up to us, it's up to you to respond to that fact and come out of the kingdom. The the scripture doesn't say that the farmer is throwing seeds just to a few people. He's scattering seeds. This is a fact for the whole world to know. The whole world can know that Jesus died and was resurrected because he loved us. But it's up to us to do something about that. It's up to us to respond. If you're sitting and you're just hearing that, that does not guarantee a response. You have to put the facts together for yourself. There's some action with that. Jesus made the kingdom of God available for all. To respond means to do something as a reaction to something that's already happened. There should be a reaction that we do to the fact that our Lord and Savior died for us. That response should be, you should make him the king of your heart. If the king of kings died for you so you could be back in relationship with the Father, our response should be making Jesus the king of our heart, right? He should be the mountain where we run, the fountain we drink from. You hear, the, hear, those, hear those verbs? Those are responding verbs. We're running. We're drinking. There should be something that we're doing based on the fact that Jesus is king. This is why we worship. This is why we sing. Right? It's our response. 
It's acknowledging God. Yes, you are an almighty God. You are a loving father. I'm not deserving of your grace. I'm not deserving of your mercy. But because I, I, you love me so much, you give it to me freely and abundantly. So I worship as a response to you. Every single thing that we do should be grounded in this response. This is why the scripture says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then everything else will be added. We have to respond to the fact that the king came to restore his kingdom. When we're grounded in that, what, we, what that looks like is we step out of the kingdom of darkness and we're grounded, our feet are solid in the kingdom of God by accepting Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. But it doesn't stop there. If we want to interact with the kingdom of God in between the resurrection and the return, we have to respond, and our response should be what grounds us in the kingdom. That should be our solid footing. But we also need to be ready. We have to be ready for the kingdom. What I mean is that there's too many Christians that feel that all they have to do is respond. So yes, they check the Christian box on the survey. Yes, they start going to church. But let me be very clear, just because you're going to church does not mean you're going to Christ. Just because you start putting in actions does not mean it's the reaction that you are supposed to be giving based on the fact that the king came to restore his kingdom. There's too many Christians that I feel confused this idea of grace with the ability to do whatever it is that you want. Right? It's, I'm free, I have grace, so that means I could do whatever, whatever I want. Grace is freedom, but The freedom was you were free to step out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God. That's what you were free to do. That's what grace allowed you to do. It allowed you the ability. Before Jesus, you did not have that ability. You were not free to step from this kingdom to the other kingdom. But because of Jesus, you are now free, yes, indeed, to step out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of God. That is the freedom that grace is, for us to be able to live with God for all eternity now. You know, there's, there's so many of us that feel we could live however we want, and when Jesus comes back, then we'll get our act together for all of eternity. But let's do, let's do, let's do a fact check real quick. If you are living forever, that means this life is forever. Now, yes, we're going to be transformed to have glorious resurrected bodies, but if it's eternal life, that means it's eternal. So if you are uh, uh, saying that you are uh, 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 a kid in the kingdom, it doesn't start when you die. You become subject to that king now. Right now, you, you, you fall subject to the king because the word tells us that, the, that this kingdom will never pass. It'll never fade. It'll never be destroyed. That means it's here now. So as we say yes to God, that means we are saying yes to the rules and responsibilities of the kingdom now. Not someday in the future when you're passed away. See, this is how we grow. When you say yes, you you respond, but then you got to get ready, right? If you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, then we know that his visible kingdom will be established one day. So that means as subjects, we have to get ready for that establishment. You can't just one day, you can't put it off. If you're a subject to the kingdom, you get ready for that establishment because we know that it's coming. This means you submit your lifestyle, you submit your life to God now so you can grow into the image of the king. When you are in the kingdom of God, you should start to look more like the king because that is who you have your eyes on. 
You shouldn't be growing to look more like the world. If you're truly in the kingdom of God, if you truly have responded, you should be growing to look more like the king because that is where you are. Your thoughts are on heavenly things. You're not being distracted by the things of the world. You know, it's, it's like if I told you all, you won tickets to Disney's Magic Kingdom. An all-expense paid trip. If I said that to you all, you all would first probably respond and say, yes, I'm in, I'm going. But the next step would be that you would get ready for the trip. It wouldn't just be business as usual. You would get ready for the trip. See, this is how it is with Jesus. He paid an all-expense paid trip to the master's kingdom with his own blood, which far exceeds a $126 admission ticket. With his own blood, he paid an all-expense paid trip to the master's kingdom. If we respond by acknowledging that, our next move should be getting ready, which means that we are delivering to God our sinful baggage of our past so we can be traveling light for our trip. We shouldn't have the baggage anymore, and it's a process. But as you get ready, you should be unloading some of your sinful habits so that you can be ready for the trip, so you can be ready to serve, to be in the kingdom of God. If we want to interact with the kingdom of God, we have to respond. Our response is what grounds us in the kingdom. But we also have to get ready because the kingdom is here, but it's also to come. So we have to get ready for the kingdom. Getting ready is what helps us grow in the kingdom. And lastly, we have to represent it. If we want to interact with the kingdom of God, we we have to represent the kingdom of God. And those of you that know our ministry model, you probably see where this is going. If we are going to represent the kingdom of God, we have to represent the kingdom of God everywhere we what? Go. If we want to represent the kingdom of God, we have to represent the kingdom of God everywhere we go. It's interesting because one of the biggest revenue sources at the Magic Kingdom and other Disney parks are souvenirs. In one travel blog, a mom recommended that one should budget, hear this, don't have a heart attack on me, $100 a day for toys and souvenirs. That if you're planning a trip, that you should budget $100 a day just for toys and souvenirs. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, after all, what good is the magic kingdom if you cannot take a little bit of that magic with you? What, what good is the magic kingdom if, if you can't share it with somebody else? I, I have to admit, I, I, I fell victim to, to spending pointless souvenirs. I took the kids to, um, to Disneyland uh, a few months ago, actually, it was a surprise, a surprise trip, and I got caught up buying some ridiculous stuff. <laughs> but there is something I, I'm very proud of. Don't judge me. <laughs> I like this. <laughs> what good is going to the magic kingdom if you can't come back and share some of the magic with other people? See, but what y'all don't see about this, the reason why I love this so much is because on the back, I have my name embroidered in it. See, you are God's gift to the world. Just you. You're, you're, you, like Pastor Brian was saying, God loves you. Yes, he loves all of us, but your name is on it. You can't carry my souvenir to the, this is mine. 
You would look silly wearing my hat with my name on it. You can't put this on. This is my hat. This is my souvenir. You are God's ambassador. If you are going to be in the kingdom of God, we have to remember that we are ambassadors of Christ. We are citizens of heaven. We are civilians here, but we understand that our loyalty, our allegiance is not to here, it's to the kingdom that we had the freedom to step into. We need to live our lives then with the same goal that our kingdom has. We can't get caught up in the affairs of this kingdom. We have to live our lives with the same goal as our kingdom. You know, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because we follow Jesus, we we don't have to walk in darkness because we have the light of life. And we can steward that light to the world. Now, let me be clear on this, because I think this is one of the things that can trip some believers up. So, So hear this, please. Just because you are an ambassador of the kingdom of God, this does not mean that you are immune from bad things happening to you. I really want us to hear that. Because what can happen, and it's one of the enemy's tricks, is you feel, oh, I stepped into the kingdom of God, and life should go fine. So then when tragedy happens, and we saw this in the parable of the sower, when tragedy happens, we forget who we're really uh, aligned with and allegiant to. So one may be thinking, well, if the kingdom of God is here, then how come there's so much pain and suffering? How come there's still death? How come there's still sorrow? How come when I'm trying to live under the kingdom of God, I still slip into bad habits that I know are against God's kingdom's order? Well, it's because the kingdom of God on earth has not fully been established yet. It's like if you are an ambassador for a country and we're living in another country. The natural disasters that happened in the country that you were living in or the catastrophe, you would still be affected by that. Just because you are an ambassador, that doesn't mean you don't have to, that doesn't mean you have a bubble around yourself. If I was an ambassador to a foreign country, anything that happened in that country, I would be affected by. But I would understand my assignment. I would understand that I am on assignment. I'm not going to get so comfortable in the goings-ons of that country that I forget where my allegiance really is. I'm not going to go get so complacent in that country, even though there's things that may be happening around me. I'm waiting for my orders from back home. I'm moving only when I get orders from my boss if I was an ambassador to another country. We are on assignment. If we want to interact with the kingdom of God, we have to represent the kingdom everywhere we go. And in doing so, we we may show others the kingdom. You know, back in 2011, uh, there was a U.S. ambassador. His his name was Gary, Gary Locke. And he stirred up quite a stir. And there was no scandal or anything like that. There was no big deal, if you will, but he stirred up some commotion because somebody took a picture of him buying his own coffee. And Ambassador Gary Locke, he was the U.S. ambassador to China back in 2011, and he brought his own coffee, and then someone took another picture of him carrying his own bags when he got off a Uh, an airplane at the airport. Someone took a picture of that. Now, to many of us, it's like, what's the big deal? I I spent $10 on coffee this morning, all right? I carry my own bags all the time. To Americans, it may not be a big deal, but to most Chinese people, this was so unusual that it was almost unbelievable to them. How could someone who holds such a high rank as an ambassador to such a big country, not have to carry his own luggage and buy his own coffee. You see, in 
China, even a township uh, chief, who's not really that high in grand scheme of hierarchy, they have a chauffeur, they have somebody that's going to carry their bag for them everywhere they go. So to them, when they saw this picture of an ambassador in the United States, the United States of America, having to buy his own coffee and carry his own bag, it caused some type of grass movement, grassroots movement. The public in the Chinese culture, they saw this and they got excited because at the time, there was a debate going on about government spending and government transparency. So when Chinese people saw this Chinese American man who looked like them because he was a third generation Chinese American, but was carrying himself like he was a United States citizen, it stirred something in their spirit. He became kind of like a hero. And these pictures helped the public feel bold enough to try to influence their own government and bring its own government to accountability. See, y'all gonna, y'all gonna get this in a minute. See, this is how we walk as an ambassador for Christ. When we represent God everywhere we go, we understand that our allegiance is to the kingdom of God. So we're not worried about the the customs and the culture and what's going on over there. I know in my country, I carry my own bag. I buy my own coffee, so I know that's not the norm where you are, but because it's the norm where I'm from, I'm going to walk in that space over here. And in doing so, I am able to witness the true kingdom. I'm able to witness to people that, you know what, there's a different way of doing things. You don't have to do things the way you've always thought you had to do. In me being true to who I am, who God has called me to be. I walk as a souvenir to God's kingdom, demonstrating to the world that there's another kingdom out there. I'll bite invisible, it may be right now, there's another kingdom out there. And as I walk as an ambassador to that kingdom, I am putting God on display. I'm allowing people to see that there's a God who sits high but looks low. There's a God that so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that people can have the freedom to come out of the kingdom of darkness and step into the kingdom of God. It allows people the confidence to say, wait a minute. Yes, there's been a hole in my heart this whole time, but I didn't know there was any other options. Thank you for demonstrating to me that there's a God who loves me, who accepts me just the way that I am. Yes, I'm not perfect, but I know a God who is. I know a God that will never leave or forsake you. We cannot fall trapped into doing things like the culture does because we are not a part of this culture anymore. We are not a part of this world anymore. Even though we live in this world, we are citizens of heaven. And we have to represent that everywhere we go. In doing so, the kingdom of darkness gets challenged. The government of this world gets challenged. And possibly, people are introduced to the kingdom of God now. Not someday after you've taken your last breath, but right now. I conclude with this. As we prepare to dive into the Old Testament series on on kingdoms, let's enjoy reading how God's story unfolds as he prepares to penetrate the timeline of humanity, bringing the kingdom of God to earth through Jesus Christ. 
our Lord and Savior, our King and Savior. The enemy has been defeated, and Jesus is coming back one day to fully establish his kingdom. The kingdom of God is here. Let's respond to it. Let's get ready for it. And let's represent the kingdom that will never fade away.